Yeah, uh, it's already there. Not yet. <laughs> the the computer, is... the computer is is um, now. It's concluded. It's thinking. We are computer is thinking. <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to have all on this lecture. Uh, the first lecture is uh, Dr. Professor David Deworth from State University of New York, Stonebrook, United States. He will speak. Uh, he will speak for Pyrrhus's Alexandrine homologization of Plato and Aristotle in the Cambridge Conference Lectures of 1898. Professor David Deworth, da Universidade de Nova York, em Stonebrook, nos Estados Unidos, vai falar sobre a homologização alexandrina de Platão e Aristóteles por Peirce nas conferências de Cambridge, em 1898. The second speech is Dr. Uh, Maura Striano, uh, from the University of Naples. Italy, and she will speak about pragmatism, the third road to democracy. Uh, Professora Maria Maura Estriano, da Universidade de Nápoles, vai, da Itália, vai falar sobre pragmatismo, o terceiro caminho para a democracia. After the speech, anyone can uh, raise her hand or put on this chat uh, your comments, your, uh, your questions, so you can answer, so the, the teachers can answer to you. Um, you have uh, almost one hour speech, so uh, feel comfortable. First is Professor Dewarth, Dewarth that will speak. Now, Professor Dewarth, the you, you can start. I thank, I thank you for the invitation. Um, my title has the word homologization, which I apologize for. It's a bomb. Uh, but you understand it from its uh, Greek roots. Uh, I attend in this paper, which is an excerpt from a larger paper, to portray Peirce as a Neoplatonist. Actually, the text says Neo Neoplatonist. I take my cue from the famous painting of the Renaissance artist Raphael, the School of Athens a masterpiece of Renaissance Neoplatonic humanism. It features Plato and Aristotle as the central figures while placing an array of 56 lesser philosophers and other figures, there are some younger people in there, as the central figures while placing, uh, the, uh, 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 placing the others in uh, subordinate positions, some on Plato's, some on Aristotle's side. Some of these lesser figures can be identified, but the key focus on the Vatican fresco lays its placing uh, lies, uh, lays uh, Plato and Aristotle on equal standing under the central archway. In effect, merging, merging their philosophical worldviews in an equipolent, interpenetrative, homodoxical synthesis that was in fact the distinctive stamp of the Alexandrine trajectory of Ammonia Sarkas, Plotinus and his school. In this fresco, Raphael seems to be Plotinus with a paintbrush. My suggestion here is that Peirce like-mindedly cashed in a modern version of this Renaissance Neoplatonic configuration in the sustained sinoscopic and kino Pythagorean speculation of the Cambridge Conference Lectures of 1898. The Cambridge Lectures turn out to
to express an ontosemiosis of conceivable pragmatistic updrafts, extending the hermeneutic legacy of, legacy of Neoplatonism and the late 19th century zeitgeist of classical American philosophy. Affine to degrees converging, degrees uh, converging of, of versions of which appear in the writings of Ralph Waldo Emerson, Charles's father, Benjamin Peirce's, Peirce, his contemporary, Francis Ellingwood and Cabot, Abbott and William James, but not available in the reductive naturalistic line of his contemporary Santayana, nor even in Dewey's emergent nationalism, not to mention all sorts of more extreme nominalistic, semiotic and biosemiotic, materialistic, skeptical, ironic and cynical postmodern points of departure. Versus neo neoplatonic antosemiosis expressed in the Cambridge Lectures of 1898 can just as well be called a neo Aristotelian antosemiosis for its realistic stress on the inexhaustible potencies of the Platonic world. The, pre the precedent for which, for such a neo Aristotelian semiosis, tracing back to the Cosmogenesis doctrine of Plato's Timaeus. I propose to feature Peirce's ontosemiotic merger or homologization of Plato and Aristotle by rehearsing an abundance of direct citations of his texts, so stunning for their singularity in the history of philosophy, while undermining their structural trajectory. An interest in hermeneutical conciseness must be the order of the day, though opening up portals of expanded studies. In passing, wonderful glints, gleams, and glimmerings of Plotinian and Schellingian, especially from his 1809 Freiheitsschrift and his 1811 to 1815 Die Welt Welt speculations, and corresponding strains of Emersonian amusement on the moral sentiment and nature may be found to converge, pervade, and lace together the articulations of the Cambridge Conference Lectures. In Lecture 1, Philosophy and the Conduct of Life, which is item 4 in the Essential Purse of uh, Volume 2, it, immediately, it becomes immediately apparent that the background correspondence between Peirce and William James in regard to James's invitation and expectations of Peirce's Harvard Conference Lectures comes to life. Obliquely referring to humanistic pragmatism of his dear friend, William James, Peirce chose to begin by contrasting the paradigm of the Hellenic sage as a kind of virtue signaling epistemic model of the conduct of life, which conflates philosophical theory with ethical, ethical practice, as in Socrates, knowledge is virtue, and I might add parenthetically, uh, taking to a culture canceling extreme by the cynics who trace it later back to Socrates, Contrasting that with his allegiance to Aristotle, a scientific man, said Peirce, the latter entails the epistemic stance of laboratory mindedness in contrast to that of a priori seminar mindedness, a topic resumed in lecture four, the first rule of logic, which contrasts James's the will to believe with Peirce's grand epistemic dictum, the, the will to learn. We learn that Peirce's Aristotelian bottom line paradigm of creative learning is itself of a classical stamp as it goes on to merge Aristotle with Plato in a neo plotinian reconfiguration of an essentialist as is distinguished from noumenal cosmology of the universe's manifestations or embodiments of energetic reasonableness along the same interpretive line 
of the artist Raphael's suggestion as to the equipollence of Plato and Aristotle and subordination of the moralizing Socrates and the other figures in the fresco achieved in the work of the Alexandrians, Ammonius, Sarkas, Plotinus, et al. Abinicio, Peirce argues positively a la Aristotle for the conservatism of an of sentimentalism in matters of vital importance, namely of resilient sentiments which have slowly percolated in the millennial evolution of instincts, including agapistic, as con in contrast to egotistical instincts of self-willed individuals who exaggerate the importance of their own rationation in the conduct of life. Quote, it is the instincts, the sentiments, Peirce declares here, that makes the substance of the soul. Cognition is only its surface, the locus of contact with what is external to it. Self-willed beliefs or psychological, psychological opinions have no long range evolutionary depth and no place in authentic science either. It is in Cratic beliefs or opinions are what you are prepared to act upon here and now, but pure science has nothing in it all to do with action, said Peirce. Not just surface cognition, but human intelligence, thirdness, is a power, it's actually an occult power that raises animal instinct onto a higher plane of soulful theoretical vitality. He inscribes that sense of intellectual energy into his later phase essays on pragmatic, pragmatism. Action, on the other hand, is psychologistic and worse, inevitably political or politicized. Lecture three, the logic of relatives resumes this creative Aristotelian uh, trajectory of resilient teleology of nature's and the human mind's collateral semiosis in asserting, again, contra James, among others, one of his crucial bottom line teachings, namely that the logic of things is independent of psychology. Herein in later passages, he aligns philosophy with mathematics, metaphysics, and logic, excluding ex existentialistic ethics and empirical psychology. And that's also, uh, from what is called literary psychology, as in Santayana's signature phrase and in the various contemporary nominalistic versions of postmodern lit crit. For reasons finally clarified by the grand antosemiosis of lecture eight on the human mind's capacity for participation in the universe's evolutionary mathesis of symbolic generality. Unfortunately, I will not get that far in this brief paper, but it's in my longer paper because, of course, we know everything culminates in uh, chapter eight of the reason and the logic of things, uh, where the whole full blast of the Platonic world. In this initial context of the Cambridge lectures, Peirce inscribes a short form of his 1893 classification of the heuretic or truth discovering sciences, mathematics, sinoscopy or philosophy as a special sciences with an additional animad version that the tendency in the sciences is that of the more concrete sciences growing into more abstract sciences, all ideally converging into mathematics in the theoromatic mathesis of pure generalization in regard to manifestations of the continuum of the platonic world, which is the topic of uh, lecture eight, entitled The Logic of Continuity. This theoromatic sense of the evolutionary coalescence of anthropomorphic and cosmomorphic intelligibility ex alternately expressed theory of creative continuity in the form of fallibilistic metaphysical empiricism reprises Peirce's line of shelling fashioned objective idealism 
articulated in the Architecture of Theories, 1891. Such a synarchistic creative relationality realized in the eidetic sciences, first declares, declares, refutes the skeptical and materialistic sense of a boundless void of arbitrariness in the nature of things. As already noted, the original provenance of this line of eidetic cosmogenesis traces back to the anto-semiotic symbolism of Plato's Timaeus, which Plato transformed from his earlier doctrine of statically existing qualitative forms into mathematical potentials of entelic realization. The divine craftsman, the demiurge, looks to, looks up to the essential mathematical forms to create harmonies in the unruly world of matter. The Timaeus thus presses Aristotle's correction of early Plato and historically speaking, initiated the interpretive vector carried over by the Alexandrian Neoplatonists and by Peirce's Neo-Alexandrian uh, synthesis. Uh, if I may just stop for a minute and say, so much of this is in the uh, Evo uh, Ibri, who ends his great book with a reference to the, the Timaeus. In one of my footnotes, I say, Evo is my my Virgil. Uh, okay. In the immediate sequel of the Cambridge lectures, Peirce further sowed the seeds for his cosmogonic architectonic of mathematics, ma metaphysics, and logic as connateral realizations of a platonic world, itself a metaphor for the boundless continuum of all potential qualities and dimensions comprised of categorical spontaneity and realization. His own creative retroduction consists a la the platonic symbolization of Raphael's The School of Athens of establishing an intersaturating equivalence of the anto-semiotic anto values of Plato and Aristotle. He astutely reads Plato as having been, quote, very right and very wrong though still having realized, quote, the definite philosophy. Plato's maturely developed sense of ideas as mathematical relations refuted the era of Heraclitus and the era of his own, uh, Plato's own earlier uh, theory that motion entails transitoriness of continua. As in Heraclitus, you can't step into the same river twice or the postulate of discrete instances of cinematic trans. Satoriness and Zeno's reputation of motion in the race of Achilles and the tortoise. In his own categorical terms, Peirce, following Aristotle's unimpeachable contemporary testimony, interpreted Plato's later period as having abandoned his early theory of ideas in favor of mathematical essences, not possessed of actual existence, but only a potential being that are quote, quite as real as though, quote, his maturest philosophy becomes welded into mathematics. A side note here, Raphael's The School of Athens portrays a rather pessimistic, brooding Heraclitus, dangerously close to us viewers at the front of the Vatican fresco. So much more can be said about the, you know, the, the painting, but I'm happy restrain myself. In this regard, let me draw attention to the astute account of J. N. Findlay, uh, formerly of Boston University, in his uh, article, The Neoplatonism of Plato, which supports Peirce's reading of Aristotle's authoritative testimony as to the mathematization of the forms in Plato's mature philosophy. Quote, from, uh, from Finley. From this material, Aristotle's two complete treatises, one on the ideas and one on the good, the remnants of which are found in Aristotle's metaphysics and in the commentary of Alexander, Aphrodisius, and others, 
And there's other remnants, for example, in the uh, uh, Nicomachean ethics and in the day I might refer to later. <clears throat> we know that Plato, as far back probably at the time of the Republic, had replaced the moralisms of Socrates with a thoroughgoing mathematization of all the forms and had come to see them in complex, many dimensional patterns of numbers and numerical ratios and believed in some sort of logical pro procession of all of them from a supreme principle of unity, which was also a principle of goodness. This principle of unity exercised mastery over another principle of indefiniteness, continuity and badness and gave, gave rise to the forms, uh, other forms, and, and, and it then operated on a second version of the same indefinite continuity and badness, thus giving rise by way of the soul of souls, which were themselves pure exemplifications of ratio to the numberless instances of ideal natures that confront us in the world of change and becoming. That is a great passage in the day of the Middle East. Uh, uh, I, 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 I showed that to my colleague, Lee Miller, at Sunnybrook Plot Department, especially the, the Plato and the, everything. And he said, oh, no, that's not in Plato. Well, I said, that's in, that's in J.N. And Finley. And J.N. And Finley was uh, Lee Miller's teacher at Washington University. <laughs> so uh, the point is, Lee, Lee Miller flunked out on that one, in my opinion. And now the crucial teachable, teachable lesson here is, is, is that in advance of Finley's second, uh, Finley's account published in 1976, Peirce theorized in 1898 that making the ideas potential and continuous in a kind of pure mathematics generates his philosophy of thirdness. Plato fell short by only recognizing quality or firstness as existing, secondness, and thus making himself an apostle of dichotomy by way, by way of erroneously subordinating external causes, secondness, to the moral superiority of the higher platonic wisdom, the Socratic, the Socratic Hellenic <laughs> stage and, and lecture one. Instead of his divided line, Plato should have welded the two propositions together, says, says Peirce. The moral influence and the mathematical continuum of ideas to achieve a, quote, a correct view of the ultimate end of philosophy and of science in general, quote. Thus revising Platonic idealism by bringing an Aristotle's sense of existential secondness, the, the scientific facts and the ongoing energetic reasonableness, thirdness, of the Antelic universe. In further interpretive exegesis, as exemplified or suggested by the sophists, we can say Plato corrected his own Heraclitean era by trading the forms of numbers, as in Aristotle's metaphysics and the De Anima. Uh, uh, Peirce interprets Plato's former doctrine of static forms is only implying firstness, whereas his Plato's whole philosophy is a philosophy of thirdness, even though Plato seemed not to have realized this. By abandoning the noumenal, supernatural forms in exchange for numbers or mathematical essences, and taking what Peirce holds mathematics to be, that is pure abduction, uh, Peirce accounted for two categorical forms of being actual or existing being and being in potentia. Their creative synthesis of thirdness becomes the doctrine of energetic reasonableness and the emanational read synarchistic theory of Peirce's own neoplotonism, namely the philosophy of vital contemplation of the one's glory power of beauty and goodness in natural and metaphysical orders of inexhaustible mathematical generalities and ensouled instantiations. So here, I am also suggesting that Peirce's neoplatonism conveyed the transmutational forms 
of Schelling's objective idealism and like Aeneas carrying his father on his shoulders conveyed the essential gist of Benjamin Peirce's ideal realism into the tritistic obligations of his categoriology. Peirce called his final doctrine cynicism, also tritism, and so postulating the continuum of conlateral growth of human reasons, fallibilistic contemplation of the logic of things, that is of concretely energizing reasonableness in an evolutionary cosmogony of the manifestation of the platonic world. In passing, I would also suggest that Whitehead's process philosophy participated in this neo-Plotinian Renaissance. Whitehead elaborated an architectonic philosophy of organism, itself arguably rooted in Cambridge Platonism. You know, and I had Samuel Alexander and these people too, uh, as was Persis too, rooted in Cambridge Neoplatonism. Uh, you know, he, he, he loved uh, Ralph Cudworth. And I should think in Schelling's Natur philosophy, which followed Peirce in articulating uh, White, that Whitehead now, followed Peirce, Whitehead later, 1925, and uh, articulating a like-minded convergence of Platonic and Aristotelian variables. Both Peirce and Whitehead were Platonizing Aristotelian mathematicians. Well, now, in this free-filling spirit of appreciating such legacy paradigms, I have more to say about the word legacy, perhaps. Let me now cite some of the exact formulations of Peirce's Cambridge lectures that arguably are Neoplatinian and speculative trajectory par excellence. In the same lecture three, the logic of relatives, Peirce uh, thematizes a logic of things that independent of psychologism and a theoretical updraft that lifts the discussion of lecture one. It takes up his longstanding rejection of nominalistic, phenomenalistic interpretation of nature and human life in reference to the theme, what is reality? Peirce writes, as I have repeatedly insisted, the concept of reality is but a retroduction, a working hypothesis, uh, which we try, our one desperate forlorn, forlorn hope of knowing anything. And what such a working hypothesis comes to is that, quote, the world lives and moves and has its being in a logic of events. I know, I know Ivo quoted that in his uh, great book. Accordingly, against the nominalistic persuasion of the contemporaries, including James and Dewey, Peirce rather remarkably affers, uh, avers, uh, declares that nature, quote, nature also makes inductions and retroductions. I, I love that line. Evolution, whatever, uh, wherever it takes place, is one vast succession of generalizations by which matter is becoming subject to ever higher and higher laws. And I point to the infinite variety of nature as testifying to her own uh, originality or power of reproduction. Now, if I could just apparently uh, add, if you read uh, the great work of uh, Tayyad de Chardin, that's 1855, or, or of uh, Michael Pagliani, uh, Pagliani, the personal knowledge, that's like 18, 50, 1950, 1955, 1958, or, or then read uh, uh, Lauren Isley, uh, or uh, the contemporary uh, Simon Conway Morris. They're all simply repeating what Peirce said. Peirce created the, the wider theoretical framework for, for these people. Uh, uh, about this this wonderful meaty uh, set of lines. Nature also makes inductions and re retroductions. Uh, uh, parenthetically, I venture to suggest, Peirce's words reconfigure the Alexandrian trajectory of the one, the hen, and the mind, noose, and soul, or life, suke, 
as metaphysical dimensions of an architectonic theory, theoria, of real nature in terms of a contemplative proliferation and reproduction. So again, quote, real thirdness there must somewhere be, says Peirce. And now back to his correction of Platonism, Peirce declares the most hopeless of metaphysical theories is that continuity, meaning real continuity, real organicity, real syndicism is a fiction. And again, here, Peirce is on the same page with Emerson's critique of the skepticism of miscellaneous randomness. My larger paper goes into uh, Emerson, Santiana, and Peirce. Moreover, Peirce goes on to say, we're in his lectures again, the, quote, the extraordinary disposition of the human mind to think of everything under the difficult and almost incomprehensible form of a continuum can only be explained by supposing that each one of us is in his own real nature a continuum. See, Michael Pagliani, he's good on that one in the, the, the book, Personal Knowledge. Uh, later in lecture seven, uh, Reason and the Logic of Things, uh, we indeed learn the intelligibility of nature from the best example, name the plasticity, plasticity of our own minds. The pragmatist, the pragmatist lesson here is that the only, quote, the only things valuable, even here in this life, are the continuities. The zero collection is bare, abstract, germinal possibility. The continuum is concrete, developed personality. Accordingly, the whole universe of true and real possibilities forms a continuum upon which this universe of actual existence is by virtue of the essential secondness of existence, a discontinuous mark. There is room in the world of possibility for any multitude of such universes of existence. And consequently, even in this transitory life, quote, the only value of all arbitrary arrangements which mark actuality, which spring out of every hand and all the time as the act of creation goes on, their only value is to be shaped in a continuous delineation under a creative hand. And at any rate, their only use for us is to hold us down to, feature, to learning one lesson at a time so that we may make generalizations of intellect and the more important generalizations of sentiment which make the value of this world. Again, these are some absolutely gorgeous sentences of Peirce. These valuations make good on Peirce's indication of his intellectual biography in the opening paragraph of The Law of Mind, that his philosophy is a modification into scientific and mathematical vocabulary of the Neoplatonic and Transcendentalist traditions. And here, reprising other themes articulated in his five monist articles of 1891-93, Peirce goes on in this context to detail how endeavors to effectuate continuity have been the great task of the 19th century. And I'll read that footnote. I'm skipping all the other footnotes where he says, endeavors to effectuate continuity have been the great task of the 19th century, to bind ideas together, to bind together facts, to bind together knowledge, to bind together sentiment, to bind together the purposes of men, to bind together industry, to bind together great works, to bind together power, to bind together nations and to great natural living systems was the business that lay before our great grandfathers to commence and which we are now just about to pass into a second and more advanced stage of development. Such a work will not be aided by regarding continuity as an unreal figment. It cannot but be helped by regarding it, regarding it as the real possible eternal order of things to which we are trying to make our arbitrariness conform. This is great stuff, folks. Such a network, quoting Peirce again, will not be aided by regarding continuity as an unreal fiction. 
But, oh, well, I, I just quoted that. Generalization, the spilling out of continuous systems and thought and sentiment and deed is the true end of life. End quote. Once again, I suggest we need only substitute Plotinus's notion of ascendant contemplation qua theory, theoria, for Peirce's generalization to get the full anthosemiotic effect. Ascendant translates as would be generalization and creative connaturality. In such original Neoplatinian terms, Peirce absorbed Emerson's transcendental naturalism over against the skeptical materialism of Santayana, not to mention generations of 19th, 20th, and now 20th century Darwinian and neo-Darwinian naturalists, logical positivists, and postmodern humanists. Closer to home, he inscribed his father Benjamin's ideal realism and folding it into his cosmology. Lecture four, the first rule of logic, then spells out the fallibilistic disposition of contemplative pragmatistic mindedness that is part and parcel of this neo platinian merger or homodoxy of Platonic and Aristotelian semiosis. Uh, I, I stop and say, can you imagine him reading this out to the Harvard uh, philosophy department? <laughs> I, and uh, some students say, is that woman right over their heads, I'm sure. Uh, it begins with Peirce asserting how reasoning has, quote, the wonderful power of correcting itself in the interpretive re representations of the three forms of valid inference, induction, deduction, and abduction or retroduction. He notes that the retroductive or explanatory idioscopic sciences, including geology, paleontology, and biological evolution, uh, uh, he, he notes that they, they are, uh, okay, even novelists, he says, can contain the growth of their characters. Uh, this self-correcting feature of explanatory inquiry involves no will to learn. The failure of the American universities, a uh, purse declares, is that they are institutions of teaching but not learning. Here, purse does not refer to James's will to believe or, Sian or Santiana's materialistic version of animal faith, skeptically employed, but rather inscribes his long standing Amazonian and of course, Plotinian and Schellingian critique of positivistic data facticity scientism. Our educational institutions, said Peirce, must disabuse the student of the popular notion that modern science is so great a thing as to be commensurate with the nature and indeed constitute of itself some account of the universe. And to show him that it is Yet, what it appeared to Isaac Newton to be a child's collection of pebbles gathered upon the beach, the vast notion of being lying there unsounded. And another quote follows, not only is our knowledge thus limited in scope, but it's even more important to see, uh, important that we should thoroughly realize that the very best we, humanly speaking, know is only in an uncertain and in an exact way. And this leads Peirce to reiterate the fallibilistic entelechy of his ontological semiotics, namely, quote, that the first in the one sense, and in one sense, the, the sole rule of reason, that in order to learn, you must first desire to learn, and in so desiring not to be satisfied with what you already in, are inclined to think, there follows one corollary, which itself is deserved to be inscribed upon every wall of the city of philosophy, do not block the road uh, of inquiry. Again, setting up a philosophy which barricades, barricades the role, road to further advance toward the truth, Peirce ends the lecture by reasserting four familiar maxims, familiar from his earlier epistemological writings. First, the, the fallacy of absolute assertion, which he explains further. Second is maintaining that this, that, 
or the other never can be known, which explains further. Third is maintaining that this, that, or the other element of science is basic, ultimate, independent of what else, not only inexplicable, there being nothing beneath it to know. And four, in holding that this or that law or truth has found its last and perfect formulation, and especially that the ordinary and usual course of nature can never be broken through. These familiar maxims reprise Persis earlier epistemic, epistemic postulates and some consequences of foreign capacities, but it is important to note that the agenda of the Cambridge lectures is now to upgrade this later phase, his later phase pragmaticism into a realistic cosmology of the Platonic world. And here again, we note Peirce writes with perfect resonances of Emerson's uh, moral sentiment in nature, quote, moreover, in all its progress, science vaguely feels that it's only learning a lesson. The value of facts to it lies in this only, that they belong to nature, and nature is something great and beautiful and sacred and eternal and real, the object of its worship and its aspirations. My final word. This may be the finest, most meaningfully realistic sentence Peirce ever wrote. I have suggested that its provenance traces all the way back to Plotinus' homologization of the Anthos semiotic principles of Plato and Aristotle. Science and life is evolutionary theory in the form of ascendant contemplation of nature, which is itself the canaterally ascendant contemplation of soul or life. And soul or life is mind in motion in Plotinus, which itself is the ascendant contemplation of a cosmos noetas, which is mind at rest. All synarchistically expressions of the creative nature of things. Thank you. Thank you, Professor David Redeworth, for your excellent uh, speech. Now uh, we are going to hear a commentary of this speech by Professor Mariana Bruins from Paulista State University, uh, Campus Marília, uh, in Brazil. Agora vamos ouvir o comentário da professora doutora Mariana Browens, da Universidade Estadual Paulista, Marília, Brasil. Professora Mariana, a palavra é da senhora. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. But uh, first of all, I would like to express my um, sadness because of the passing of Gal Costa this morning and it, because she was a, I think one of the greatest singers, uh, Brazilian singers of all time. So uh, it, um, it's really, really sad. Um, well, um, um, então eu um, gostaria de primeiro manifestar minha tristeza pelo falecimento da Gal Costa é uma das maiores cantoras brasileiras de todos os tempos, é, que ocorreu hoje de manhã. Né? É, bem, é, dito isto, eu é, gostaria de agradecer enormemente aos organizadores pela, é, pelo convite para participar desta sessão e especialmente ao professor Dilworth, é, pela sua tão erudita eh, conferência. Eh, em seu, em seu uh, uh, paper, né? eh, o professor Dilworth apresenta uma interpretação sobre as uh, conferências de Cambridge de 1898, proferidas por Peirce, e eh, nesse paper o, o, o objetivo central é desdobrar a essência da versão persiana de um eh, neoplatonismo cos cosmogônico. Para alcançar tal objetivo, o professor eh, trata da homologização 
neoplatônica dos sistemas de Platão e Aristóteles, isto é, dessa busca promovida pelos neoplatônicos de estruturas e elementos comuns entre os sistemas destes dois filósofos clássicos do pensamento ocidental, que tanto teriam influenciado os intelectuais neoplatônicos e o próprio Peirce. Ressalta o professor, a partir do célebre quadro Escola de Atenas, né, que eu trouxe aqui né, para uh, lembrar desse belíssimo, dessa belíssima pintura de Rafael, né? uh, 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 pintura que é de inspiração uh, do humanismo neoplatônico, que os sistemas desses filósofos clássicos seriam interligados, né? é, ocupariam uma mesma hierarquia, como o professor ressalta, no, estariam no mesmo patamar, né? é, é, considerados como é, é, estando no mesmo patamar pelos neoplatônicos. Né? É, 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 e esses sistemas estariam interligados, confundindo-se entre si, como o professor procura mostrar a partir do seu texto, por meio e a partir das mencionadas conferências proferidas por Peirce. Uma vez que eu careço da erudição do professor, cujo texto abarca vários temas com muita profundidade, fui capaz de formular as duas questões que, que seguem. E eu peço desculpas porque, devido justamente à complexidade dos tópicos tratados, minhas questões são antes questões de esclarecimento. Parto a primeira questão. É, ao discutir o conceito de justiça no diálogo à república, é, remembering that is, uh, the republic is a dialogue of uh, Plato's maturity, né? é, lembrando que a república é um diálogo da maturidade platônica, né? é, Platão defende é, uma tese forte sobre a relação entre sumo bem e sumo saber a partir da sua eh, teoria das ideias. Na conversa entre Glauco e Sócrates, quando Sócrates, eh, quando Sócrates eh, está tentando responder a questões difíceis relativas à definição de justiça, Platão afirma que não devemos introduzir toda a forma de diferença e mesmo idade na natureza. Em vez disso, devemos focalizar uma forma de mesma idade e diferença relevante para os próprios modos de vida particulares. E essa forma é a forma do bem. Essa forma é a base para a compreensão, segundo Platão, de todas as outras formas. É o que nos permite compreender todo o resto, segundo ele. Através da conversa entre Sócrates e Glauco, Platão faz uma analogia da forma do bem com o sol, pois é o sol que nos permite ver as coisas. Mas ele faz uma distinção muito importante porque o sol, ele próprio, não é visão, mas é a causa da própria visão. Assim como o sol está no reino do visível, a forma do bem estaria no reino do inteligível. É o que dá a verdade às coisas conhecidas e o poder de conhecer a quem conhece. Não é apenas a causa do conhecimento e da verdade, 
é também um objeto do conhecimento. Platão identifica como a forma do bem permite ao conhecimento compreender conceitos tão difíceis como o próprio conceito de justiça, que até hoje é alvo de é, inúmeros estudos e debates, enfim, como seria de se esperar. Né? É, Platão identifica o conhecimento e a verdade como importantes, como muito relevantes, mas, através de Sócrates, nesta passagem eh, da República, ele afirma que o bem é ainda mais valorizado. Ele, então, passa a explicar, embora o bem não seja o ser, é superior a ele em posição e poder. E é o bem que provê conhecimento e verdade. No entanto, em relação a essa identificação entre bem e uh, saber, entre bem e verdade, promovida por uh, Platão, Aristóteles uh, discute a forma de bem em termos críticos inúmeras vezes, tanto na ética eudêmia quanto na ética nicomaqueia, ética nicômaco. Né? Aristóteles argumenta que a forma do bem de Platão não se aplica ao mundo físico, pois Platão não atribui bondade a nada no mundo existente. Como a forma do bem de Platão não explica eventos no mundo físico, os seres humanos não teriam motivos para acreditar que a forma do bem existe. Assim, a forma do bem seria, para Aristóteles, portanto, irrelevante para a ética humana. Assim, minha primeira pergunta é como promover uma homologia entre as concepções, por exemplo, entre as concepções éticas de Platão e Aristóteles, sem desconsiderar as profundas diferenças e divergências entre ambos e as críticas, por vezes contundentes, que Aristóteles dirige a seu mentor intelectual? Então, essa é a minha uh, primeira pergunta. É, minha seg é, segunda pergunta diz respeito à distinção entre é, ensinar e aprender, formulada por Peirce em sua quarta conferência e analisada pelo professor Dilworth em seu paper. Na referência da conferência, Peirce discute e lamenta a suposta decadência das universidades estadunidenses por promoverem na educação superior o ensino em detrimento do eh, aprendizado. A distinção proposta por Peirce entre essas duas práticas das instituições educacionais descreve um problema que parece estar até hoje presente no ensino superior em geral, qual seja a promoção de uma aquisição puramente mecânica de conhecimento versus uma educação crítica, ética e argumentativa. Tal problema se manifestou em toda a sua força eh, recentemente durante a pandemia eh, da Covid-19, em que vimos pessoas com alto grau de instrução aderirem a crenças adquiridas pelo método da autoridade, do mais elementar negacionismo científico em relação à gravidade da doença e às estratégias de sua prevenção, por exemplo, o distanciamento social. Considerando este trágico panorama, o professor teria alguma sugestão para promover o aprendizado do falibilismo persiano, o qual constituiria, no meu entender, um importante modo de combater o negacionismo científico e promover 
o aprendizado sem cair em um cientificismo ingênuo. É, mais uma vez, uh, obrigada uh, ao professor Wilworth, uh, Dilworth, perdão, uh, pela oportunidade de discutir estas e outras importantes uh, questões e tópicos em filosofia. Muito obrigada. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Mariana Bruins. Now, please, Professor David Dilworth. Can you answer those questions? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll give it a, a, a try. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Mariana, for this <laughs> hard questions. Okay, well, as far as the first one, uh, that's my whole paper. The, you ask, uh, how could there be this hom homologization, uh, given the fact that Plato says what he says about the idea of the good being beyond the you know, uh, dignity and power in the Republic and uh, Aristotle's critique of it in the Comicane Ethics and other places. Well, that's my whole paper. Uh, my paper says uh, that Plato gave up the Republic. Uh, th that's the, the, the earlier Socraticized Plato, emphasizing the, the wisdom of uh, the, the, the Platonic sage. Okay, but he gave that up. Uh, so uh, he, in other words, he, he went for Aristotle and, and he agreed with Aristotle in his later career, uh, the mathematization. Uh, so that my whole paper is on that point that he, he, and as for the idea of the good, of course, he retained it in the form of the good is the fusion of itself. Well, if, uh, put this way, Plotinus uh, retained it, the good, it's the fusion of itself. It's actually the one is, is the fusion of itself in the form of the good and, and the soul and so forth. It's a you know an interesting issue that to be worked out. But that, so that's the easy answer to the first one. My whole paper is that Plato gave up the the, uh, uh, the moralized uh, republic uh, uh, because he gave up Socrates uh, for this uh, later position, which is found in the Sophists and the Parmenides and the Timaeus. Uh, you know, the, the Sophists is the three ultimate uh, concepts, uh, uh, one and many, uh, motion and rest, and same and difference. And then the Parmenides is just a variation on the one and the many. Those are the fundamental concepts. And, and then Plotinus came along and uh, wrapped them up in, in the, this new synthesis. Uh, you see, so another answer to your question is uh, Peirce's ability to uh, not confuse, but perfuse Plato and Aristotle uh, is his own creative abduction, his own creative retroduction. You know, he synthesizes these opposites in a, in a higher a generality. That, that's the genius of Plotinus and uh, Okay, now for the second question, which is a nasty question, uh, right, about uh, uh, re reference to the, uh, the will to learn versus will to believe and uh, uh, apply to COVID and this whole question of scientific denialism, which is, uh, uh, let's face it, a, a politicized remark on your your side, uh, I, I would answer in uh, Peirce's uh, terms, or at least in my mind, my own mind, that yes, at first COVID was uh, an overwhelmingly uh, a disaster that hit the world, you know, and we went into that, that part of it. Uh, but science gradually began to figure it out. At first science too was perplexed. The scientific community, you know, got caught up in all this, uh, you know, politicization uh, of it. Okay, Fauci and those guys. But eventually, the medical community began to figure it out, and they figured it out that if you deal with it in the early phases, you probably can, uh, you know, get be cured. Okay, 
uh, so, uh, and that's how science works. So science grew in, in, in a self-correcting method and learned how to deal with COVID. Of course, still there is any virus, there's zillions of viruses in the air, and we have to then cope with them progressively. And we're doing a good job. Now, as far as America goes, you know, this awful place where that's a, the bad institutions uh, uh, of learning and, and politics, it's a trade-off. There's no, there's no algorithm uh, the, between the, uh, the theoretical, the practical, being the moral and the political and the productive that reduces them to one thing. There's, there's three, that's the way episteme is. The, the purely theoretical as in the scientific community, the political as well as the personal and moral, and then there's the, the technocratic or the productive, uh, the, the, you know, the three uh, dimensions of uh, uh, science in, in Aristotle. And in America, and I hope in oh, the rest of the world, it, it, it's a messy situation. There'll always be a trade-off. Nobody's got the answer. Everyone has to contribute their expertise, whether purely theoretical, practical, political, or personally moral, or productive in the sense of, you know, uh, the, the, the application in the medical community. Uh, so, but to see the, the socialist type guys, they think they have one solution, but because they identify, they reduce the three uh, to praxis, political practice, you see. But basically, in the academia, which uh, uh, gets into this business of, uh, of blame gaming, uh, scientific denialism, they're, they're just preachers, uh, uh, blame game preachers. Uh, in my opinion, that, that are, you know, that's the whole continental wing. Uh, whereas uh, the, the essence of American democracy and pragmaticism, a la purse, is the two great tasks of humanity are theory and practice, and not reduce one to the other. What was the, 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 the scientific, Typic denial guys, to my my experience, maybe not true in Brazil. Uh, are, they are these continental socialists who think that they could they play a blame game, but they have no solutions. The solution, the medical profession learned how to work with it within the limits that you know. Uh, we have the uh, winter flu. We have all kinds of flus. And, and the medical profession will deal with them. And it has partially to do with the people's, uh, there's no one size fits all. The, the people's immunities differ, you see. Uh, and some people are being like, my, my sister she's getting vaccinated four times. <laughs> well, I contrast with uh, Novak uh, Djokovic, you know, the greatest uh, tennis player in the world today, who used to be vaccinated. And so they wouldn't let him into America or Australia for the, the, the tennis tournament, you know, the people have different uh, immune systems and different psychologies that go with it. So it's a big, messy issue that cannot be dealt with in the these reductive terms of the science deniers, uh, the critique of the science deniers. There's, there's more to it. That's my uh, okay. Attempt Thank you. Uh, uh, let me so uh, say something. Uh, do you think that this uh, uh, last version of uh, um, Platonic theory of ideas, the mathematician, uh, the mathematical version of idea, will um, uh, um, or uh, or suffice? To, to deal with ethical problems because I choose the, uh, um, the, this uh, a form of good and, and true uh, um, exactly because I think it's there's no there, there's no way to mathematize um, 
this uh, kind of, of, of concept or um, to propose a, a theoretical mathematical approach of ethics as uh, suggested in this uh, last version uh, of, of Plato. That's, that's all. <laughs> but thank you for your answer. Well, Matt, um, uh, if you look at Matthew, Matt Moore's book on uh, mathematics and Plato, and, and any other place, it's, mathematics is not a, a mathematics of quantity or extended substance, but of quality. And once you introduce the, the methesis of quality, then you have, you can turn to the th three normative sciences, the first of which is aesthetics, so, or hyper aesthetics, you see, which is, uh, uh, the, which then it uh, suffuses uh, in a kind of Plotinus way the, the good and, and the logical uh, norm, normativity. You see, so uh, uh, Peirce's mathematics of, of pure generalization of the Platonic world is a, uh, himself a uh, I think it rather brilliantly puts in the the, the, uh, the categorical form of the firstness of the aesthetic admirableness or worshipableness for its own sake, which then uh, uh, informs the, the, the summa bonum of, of of the good or 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 the or the true. It's the three transcendentals, but the first one is the beauty, and that's. Right out, it's, it's, Emerson has the whole thing, you know, he and the poet, the beauty is the creator of the universe. That's Plotinus. Now, the, so the interesting thing in the Plotinus, he has a way of playing around with these words. Sometimes he, he calls the one beautiful or the good, but other times, and it's more uh, literal, uh, the good is the world of noose, and the beautiful is the world of noose. But it, it's kind of uh, a little bit he had wiggle room there. And so, but the, the ultimate principle is the one which is not something. It's the one is all things, but not a single one of them. That's the creative principle. That's the, the good as Plato's good as diffusive of itself, or, or the corresponding concept in the Timaeus. So it's a creative principle. That's why I connect them with Whitehead. It's, the, it's not a noose principle. The, the one is a creative principle beyond noose, but but it's it says it's the glory of noose, the power of noose, uh, and 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 the, and the power of noose diffuses, uh, you know, perfuses into the the this soul, which is noose and mind in motion, and nature is the lower end of soul, but then there is the ascendant. You okay, know, thank you. You have to work Thank it you out. very much. You have okay. to work it Thank out. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jewood, for your answers. Due to this short time we have, we can only accept one more question. Please pose to the question if anyone uh, will ask on chat, please. Or raise your hand. Uh, uh, Vincent is raising uh, his hand. Uh, I don't know since the end of the yeah. of the might, uh, might talk. I ask a question? Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, I, I do want to make a comment, David. However, um, I think there's nothing more reductive than pejorative definitions. Being a socialist guy. I don't think there's one, I never thought there was one answer. So I'll leave that be. Three words, action, evolution, participation. I, lo I loved your uh, broad sweeping uh, canvas. I do think we need to get down to some details and I only have time for one. Um, there's action, uh, one can think about thought being for the sake of action, or one can think with Peirce and Dewey, 
and James that thought is a mode of conduct. Thought is itself a mode of conduct. So I, I think that there's no knowing without doing. And I think Peirce thinks that. So there's the, there is the action internal to inquiry. You have to conduct an experiment. And there's the action subsequent to experimentation. So I think it's very important to draw that distinction and not to make Peirce less of a pragmatist than he is. And to Peirce is a pragmatist who went beyond pragmatism, which he identified with James, who, I, who, who reduces to action. But the, the distinction between action and thought, firstness, secondness, and thirdness. Pragmat but, but, but David, uh, a, David, yes, and yes. All those texts where he critiques William James. Uh, on I, I, that point. I know that as well as you do, of course. Sure. But, but, but David, there is the action or conduct. He would use the word, first would use the word conduct that's I imminent to experimentation. You cannot, uh, an experiment is, um, is at once a action or instance of conduct and it's an instance of thought. There's no, there's a distinction, but no separation. A thirdness includes secondness, but it goes beyond it. So thought, we're in, we're in thought agreement, is not reducible to action. A conduct is thirdness. Which includes the the action stuff. Okay, we're about. we're in we're in agreement. Hmm. Okay. Good. Wow, that's a relief. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you very much for all the discussion. We will have a break of fifteen minutes, and we will start uh, four p.m. sharp. Okay. Thank you.